I think it has started. So let me let me welcome everyone. Um, my role this time, as um, in previous occasions, it's only to welcome you all, um, to remind you that this is uh, an initiative, the Climate Change and Development Series that um, we launched a couple of years ago uh, with Laura's leadership to try to promote um, across both within the department, but also across the development community, given that most of the events that we have done have been online, um, a discussion about interactions between climate change and development and what it that meant to think and think about what's going on in the world um, today and in the future. We have been fortunate to have great speakers and um, today is not an exception. Um, and I'm also extremely happy, not only that Dr. Lisan agreed to come, but also that we would be able to, to think about COVID with um, the climate change and the environment and those connections in, I think, very creative ways. So like always, um, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to come. And thank you so much, Laura, for organizing. And I leave with you to present our speaker and to lead the, the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, um, Diego, and thank you so much, Lee, for being with us tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure. We wanted to invite you live, but it will happen in the near future. It's still safer to be uh, online uh, as the pandemic is still playing <clears throat> across you know, the world, a lot of tricks. Um, so let me just tell you a few words about the wonderful work that Dr. Li Zhang is doing. Um, Li gained a PhD in China, in the China Agricultural University of Beijing, in a program of development studies. And she wants to say that there are actually very few departments of development studies in her country. Um, and then she came to the United States to become a postdoctoral student for one year at Cornell, where she worked with Philip McMichael. Then she went to the University of California, where she is at the moment at Irvine. And the great news is that she's just got uh, hired at Amherst College as an assistant professor. And she will be based in both departments of anthropology, sociology, and development studies. So I can't think of anyone who shares more interest as, as you know, the ones that our department represents uh, here in Oxford. She's considering herself a developmental sociologist who uses ethnographic methods, and she's very much, therefore, a sociologist and an anthropologist. And then, because her work on agriculture and on medical issues have brought really closely together the issues of understanding something that is of a fascination for so many people in the world today, you know, what is climate change? How can development and climate change be fought together? And how has the COVID pandemic shed some light on, on this nexus? So, um, <clears throat> Lee published this wonderful little book, um, The Origin uh, of COVID-19, which is when I read that book, I said, I must talk to this woman, <laughs> you know, and so I'm so happy that you agreed uh, to give a talk to us. Um, this nexus between environmental health and human health, between health, environment and development, which is something that I try to promote in the University of Oxford with some colleagues in the geography department. We run, and, and global health, we run a very successful option for a few years on this topic, is, <clears throat> is something that is of great importance because by focusing on animal welfare, we see how this long line of research on human diets um, and the way they have been influenced by globalization and modernization make us understand better, you know, what we talk about when we talk about health and about the environment and about development. Uh, we have here in the University of Oxford a successful farming project um, called FAI, Food Animal Initiative, that started 
um, in the aftermath of the BSC crisis. And so that idea of uh, animal welfare was present in Oxford for a very long time, but has unfortunately not been brought into um, all the work that we're doing in the social sciences. It's very much based in, in zoology and we have very little interaction with them. But I hope that having you um, as, as a lecturer tonight, we will be able to explore these zoonotic spillovers um, and understand you know, the way in which climate change causation can be thought about in, in a more sociological way. So thank you very much, Lee. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for having me here. And I really, I was really looking forward to this opportunity. And thank you so much for this, um, uh, for this invitation. Then I could share more about my research. So I'm going to share my screen uh, just to make sure uh, I could have a slide space. Mm -hmm. Close to. Yes, uh, can you all see my screen? I think it works. Great. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, my presentation has three parts uh, today. First, I, I'm going to uh, briefly outline the connections between agrarian change, climate change, and pandemics. And then I will illustrate this connection talking about my, uh, my book on oranges or COVID-19. And then lastly, I will uh, raise the question about development and global health in this new century. Um, is biosecurity or agriculture a better way to approach these combined prob problems of uh, climate change and the pandemics? Um, we, uh, we all understand very well how the rise of capitalism in recent years, including the industrialization of agriculture and livestock during the 20th century, gave rise to uh, uh, the anthropo anthropogenic uh, climate change. We are, uh, uh, we are starting to understand how the same process is also increasing the incidence and the risks of pandemics. At the same time uh, that carbon emissions are rising, the number of emerging, emerging infectious diseases is also rising. Notice also that zoonosis plays a very important role. The spillover of passengers from animals to humans, and not just wild animals, but also livestock. So the industrialization of uh, livestock can give a very good example of the connections between uh, climate change and pandemics. Uh, we know that uh, the industrialization of livestock is responsible uh, for increasing emissions from manure and less uh, sustainable soil management. And that the need to grow more and more soybean and corn for livestock is a major driver of deforestation. All of these uh, are major factors um, driving climate change, but industrialization of livestock also creates animal monocultures and pathogen pests. And we see this in the rise of swine flu and even flu from China. So why are industrial uh, livestock more likely to carry highly infectious types of influenza viruses? Uh, Rob Wallace has a really good book on um, this topic. So he argues that growing genetic monocultures of domestic animals removes whatever immune fabrics uh, may be available to slow down transmission. Larger population size and, uh, and, and densities facilitate greater rates of transmission. Such crowded conditions depress immune responses. High throughput, um, a part of any industrial production provides a continually renewed supply of susceptible animals, and the, which is the fuel of uh, which is the fuel for the, the, the evolution of variants. So, in China, um, 
we, as we all know, China has become as the, the, the center of the livestock revolution, where the livestock industry had some of the fast, uh, fast and also large scale increase in the uh, whole world in recent decades. We also know that these factory farmers uh, are the main uh, uh, sets of zoonosis of influenza, as you can see from this map. Uh, this is why dangerous uh, types of avian flu and swine flu um, emerging and also wild, uh, wild spread in, uh, mainly in China. And like the rest of the world, China is also suffering dramatic climate change, such as droughts. And also, uh, um, um, like last year, what happened is also a massive flood uh, happened in my hometown, Henan. Uh, this is a picture from Zhengzhou. Um, so personally, I have been uh, studying food uh, governance and market for a long time. So when we first heard the news of a uh, unknown, unknown reason uh, pneumonia outbreak in the wet market in Wuhan, I immediately began tra tracking this situation and archiving internet materials that I could get access to that may get disappeared very soon. So this become as uh, this become the basis uh, for uh, the book that I just published on the oranges of COVID nineteen. So public debate in the West were uh, was marked by uh, mostly uh, racist narratives about China's supposedly backward uh, cultural practices of consuming wild animals and authoritarian censorship. Uh, of initial uh, outbreak, uh, including the possibility of a lab leak in Wuhan, until it was too late to prevent the pandemic. And also public debate in China also blamed wet market first, then shift to frozen food imports that implicate other countries or even possible lab leaks um, in the US instead. So both uh, Western and Chinese discourses also emphasizes the biomedical capacity of the Chinese government to contain the disease and the need to strengthen a global regime of biosecurity. But this focus uh, assumes that the increase in emerging diseases with pandemic potential is inevitable and neglects an analysis of the structural drivers of zoonosis and ways to prevent them. So my goal in this book is to shift uh, uh, the, the, the debate away from narrow cultural, political, or biomedical frameworks, uh, emphasizing instead that we must understand the oranges of COVID-19 in much more complex and structural entanglements of state-making, science and technology, and global capitalism. So the book uh, begins with SARS. Uh, the SARS outbreak of 2002 and 2003 um, was traced to the corona to a coronavirus uh, endemic among bats. So uh, this was likely um, a spillover through uh, masked palm civic cats farmed and traded in uh, wet market, mostly in southern China at the time, consumed as therapeutic food, which is also conceived uh, con uh, con considered as a, a traditional uh, Chinese med uh, medication. Uh, so the responses to SARS were a temporal, a temporal crackdown on wild, uh, wild animal and wildlife um, trade and wet markets in southern China, mostly in Guangdong, and also professionalized public health services and specialized hospitals, and also increased surveillance and experimentation on coronaviruses. So the consequences of these responses were to regulate uh, wildlife farming as a new sector of capitalist and illicit uh, economy, and, and also uh, increase uh, and also increase the concentration uh, and privatization of health care, and also deepen ties between uh, biomed uh, biomedical science and global pharmaceutical industry. So, in other words. Uh, this state making and deepening entanglements between biomedical sciences and healthcare uh, with global capitalism, instead of reducing 
the risk of zoonosis. This approach renders emerging infection disease, infectious diseases governable and even profitable. So evidently all these lessons learned from SARS and MERS uh, later on 10 years later failed to prevent the emergence of another novel coronavirus this time causing a global pandemic. And the responses to COVID-19 uh, also reinforcing this process even further. So it is true that the COVID-19 outbreak was first linked to the Wuhan Fauna market. And it's also true that as you can see from this uh, um, picture, it's, it, it is also true that there were some stores in the uh, Hanan market, uh, which are uh, selling uh, various types of wild animals. And we also know that SARS and MERS come from uh, coronaviruses uh, endemic among bats which spill over to humans uh, through interme uh, intermediary spaces like city cats and camels. So the leading hypothesis is that COVID-19 also comes from bats and most likely through uh, intermediary spaces or even more than one, uh, one type that we still haven't uh, identified for sure yet. In January, 2020, uh, uh, in January 2020, Zhong Nanshan, a very famous doctor in SARS in China, already stated that COVID-19 likely came from wild animals like bamboo rights. But this narrative has been largely suppressed in China since then. So by simply identifying uh, the host and intermediary uh, species or the patient zero or ground zero, still doesn't explain the social and ecological uh, complexity required for a pathogen to become as a disease and a pandemic disease. Let's look at pangolins as an example. Pangolins were suggested as uh, a possible host or intermediary uh, species uh, right in the beginning of the, pandemic, the epidemic in China for COVID-19. We need to understand why there has been a consumption boom in recent years of pangolin. With the food safety and environmental crisis in China and in the broader region, people are consuming more TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, or therapeutic food, which is also becoming more commodified. Pangolin scales are used to make a type of TCM. And the meat is also seen as a delicacy for rich people in Southern China. Since pangolins became extinct in China, they are being um, smuggled, smuggled from uh, Southeast Asia and even Africa, part of China's connection to global capitalism. This is why just cracking down on smuggling pangolins doesn't address the fundamental drivers of this kind of cons consumerism of wild animals. We can also see the example of bamboo rights which were a, a, a rare ethnic uh, food in Southern China, but recently became a really hot uh, commodity national wide before the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic. This is, drive, uh, this is driven by uh, social media influencers like this, uh, this guy who is a, a chef uh, uh, on internet who promotes eating bamboo rice as healthy, natural and exotic food. Uh, slides. Excuse me. Um, yeah, let's, let's just jump in over. Uh, so the Huanong brothers, um, other than this big chef, the Huanong brothers, um, uh, who are also the other uh, social media influencers, um, try to promote not just eating, but also farming bamboo rights online. So recently, more and more peasants um, began to uh, began uh, farming uh, bamboo rice, sometimes even in their own homes. I have seen this in my own field work in Guangxi um, back to 2015 and 16. And the government also, uh, the Chinese government also uh, began giving uh, subsidies to scale up and modernize bamboo rice farming. Um, 
So the, the Chinese government's approach to uh, wildlife uh, and wild animal consumption has been to increasingly regulate it as a new sector of the economy, especially through e-commerce um, and poverty elevation in frontier uh, rural uh, areas, which is mostly a remote uh, mountainous area in China. In 2016, there were uh, more than 14 million people working in this sector with a market value over 70 uh, billion uh, US dollars. So this uh, state, uh, this uh, state and scientific and capitalist strategy of modernizing wild animal, um, wild animal farming actually increases production and consumption of wildlife product and also increase the animal and human interface uh, through which novel, disease, novel diseases uh, spill over. Uh, this uh, is happening especially in, South, uh, in Southwest China on the border of Southeast Asia. This is also exactly where we have found the closest known coronavirus uh, relatives to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused COVID-19 pandemic. The main cluster is in Yunnan province here uh, in the middle of the, the map. So what wildlife trade can explain how a virus could go from a place like Yunnan to a city like Wuhan on the top of the map. Wuhan is here. So, oh, this is also, uh, this is also why uh, there were so many, uh, so much attention to a lab leak hypothesis involving the Wuhan Institute, Institute of Virology. Uh, they were exactly the team researching uh, those coronaviruses in Yunnan and this area uh, and also other areas uh, since SARS outbreak, including a close to known relative. Uh, well, it is true that there are always risks of lab incidents. This but the risk is relatively very low. Um, but there's also the risk that the scientist could be infected during a virus hunting expedition in the field. So the risk is even higher for miners and tourists. Here, for example, is the image from a TV uh, show from 2015 showing a scientist taking two families uh, from an urban area into bat caves in the Xishuang Banna Botanic Garden, where we found the second closest relative of SARS-CoV-2. And notice that the scientist is picking the bat fish uh, even without gloves. This is the scientist. So the risk is also clear in the case of Mojiang miners. In 2012, six miners working in the bat infested cave become severely ill uh, with symptoms exactly like COVID-19, and three of them died. We have very uh, detailed account from the uh, master um, uh, uh, MA assesses of the doctor who treated those patients and in, identified this as a pneumonia caused by an unknown virus. It was because of this incident uh, that the Wuhan Institute of Virology went to study Mojiang, where they found the closest known relative to SARS-CoV-2 in what they called uh, an abundant mineshaft. The Wuhan Institute of Virology was also doing other uh, significant studies on coronaviruses in the region, including a study in nearby county called Jinning County that showed, um, that showed that 2.7% of the people living near um, bat caves tested positive for SARS antibodies in 2015, but had no symptoms of infection. This shows that SARS-like coronaviruses have been circulating in this region for quite some time, but how could a local infection trigger a pandemic? So in my book, uh, I, uh, I showed all the key elements that increased dramatically in the region in recent years and noticed that all of these elements are connected to climate change, uh, either as drivers or as part of the consequences and responses to climate change. 
First is the rapid infrastructure construction, linked, uh, linking uh, remote areas to major cities and leading to rise in carbon emissions. And second is the in, uh, intensification of agriculture and mining, which uh, drives climate change. Um, intensification of agriculture and, and mining um, and climate change more broadly caused the loss of natural habitat uh, of, of, of the wild animals, which in mostly crowded uh, together in a few places and bring them closer to human as well. And also with the increase uh, in ecotourism and migration uh, and climate change displacement can also be considered here as well. And with the surge in e-commerce, um, especially for wild animals from the region, um, not just in Southwest China, but also in Southeast Asia. And with the expansion of wild, uh, wildlife farming um, and smuggling as well. And uh, the, with, with all those factors and uh, the invasive civilians also getting, uh, uh, getting increased um, because they need to, to, to have a massive uh, surveillance for novel passengers in wildlife. So all these activities expand the human wildlife um, interfaces in ways that increase the risk uh, of spillovers of novel infectious diseases and the risk that local outbreaks can become global pandemics. So whether directly from bats to humans, or indirectly through uh, intermediary species, uh, species increasingly uh, farmed in a region like bamboo rights. My hypothesis uh, in my book is that I see a gradual and uh, complex path of novel coronaviruses to emerging from the mountainous uh, area of Yunnan or the surrounding regions and trigger the first uh, major outbreak in Wuhan. We can also see the huge infrastructure boom in China since SARS, roads, railways, high-speed train, numbers of uh, passengers and flights all increased dramatically. Travel time dropped um, significantly and Wuhan is right in the middle of this whole process. Wuhan uh, was always a major transportation hub especially since the first railway bridge over the Yangtze River was built there in 1957. Uh, this can explain how an outbreak in Wuhan could become an epidemic across China and then a global pandemic in such a short time. So my book also examines uh, in detail the public health measures and debates in China from December 2019 through uh, the lockdown of Wuhan to the containment of epidemic in China, the spread of pandemic uh, worldwide and the geopolitical debates that have followed until June last year. This includes China's capacity for making so much PPEs and mobilizing so many medical workers, medical uh, workers in such short time. Uh, the whole nation uh, coordinated um, distribution of supplies and medical staff for the epicent like Wuhan. And just in Wuhan alone, 16 quarantine centers and cabin hospitals were established. Two, uh, also in, the, in addition, two specialized hospitals were built um, just in a matter of a uh, of few days. Uh, and also the mass, uh, the mass testing campaigns and the contact tracing were effectively organized nationwide, even until now. After the lockdown of Wuhan was lifted, there were major campaigns to buy from Wuhan, collective buying, and other provinces take turn, uh, taking turns uh, to restart the economy. China then also quickly shifted to um, produce masks and other medical equipment for export. So now China is not only exporting and donating uh, uh, vaccines, but also establishing uh, vaccine manufacturing in places like Africa. This also, uh, this also shows that how China was able to turn 
a domestic crisis to an opportunity for global influence, combining its state making with global capitalism. My book also argues that uh, the measures to strengthen public health, biosecurity, and drive uh, uh, economic recovery in China have been effective to contain the epidemic, but they don't address the environmental issues giving rise to emerging infectious diseases in the first place, but may even reinforce the risk of future pandemics. Uh, this can be illustrated with the example of the Xinfadi market uh, outbreak in Beijing in June 2020. This is the most modern and largest scale wholesale market in China, even in Asia. And it was the site of the first major outbreak after the, the uh, epidemic in Wuhan was contained domestically. So this outbreak shows that modernized modernization of market uh, and food system alone is not enough to stop the recurrence of disease outbreaks. This was also uh, the moment that the Chinese government and the society shift attention away from the domestic factors to the possibility that the coronaviruses can arrive into China through frozen food supply chains. This way they can shift the blame away from China, but this is also reinforces my critique of this capitalist uh, food system and this type of agrarian and development uh, uh, paradigm. So now we have this, the, 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 the mass deployment of vaccines, but we also have new variants that seem like they can escape this treatment and vaccines. So we continue to be chased by COVID into the future and until now. Ultimately, global um, public health is not derived from the most modern countries and biomedical practices or even the most effective govern, uh, governance strategies, but rather from the capacity to trans, uh, transcend our global uh, capitalism and geopolitical competition in the interest of social, social ecological uh, justice, sustainability, and the shared destiny of humanity. So let's um, get back to the discussion of uh, development, climate change, and global health. Uh, what we are seeing uh, now is the debate between the mainstream vision of biosecurity and the more critical view based on agroecology. And with more and more climate change in this new century, we'll have to face this question more and more urgently and carefully. Climate change and the further pandemics will most likely continue to be framed in mainstream discourses as a problem of biosecurity. On the one hand, some people may say we need more modern factory farms to intensify pr uh, production, spare line for nature and fight against the pathogen pests. But on the other hand, this risks, uh, this also risks the replicating the failures of the 20th century for both um, global health and development. But we can also reframe the, the global uh, health in terms of uh, agroecology. So, so the, the, for me, I think the, the agriculture can 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 stimulate uh, can simultaneously reduce carbon emissions, also can increase the resilience of food systems to climate change and reverse the drivers of zoonotic pandemics in the first place. So I invite you uh, or to uh, study more and develop a research agenda and have more discussion and debate and also with practices on this uh, question that we are all facing. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and I look forward, uh, I look forward to have, uh, yeah, questions and, and discussions with, uh, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Lee, that was very comprehensive and obviously we have lots of questions. Diego, would you like to start? Um, I can, although clearly this is more your um, 
field and your topic, Laura, but um, let me do it anyway. So I, I think it's fascinating. And, and I think you, the accent on this not being an accident or clearly um, not being something that we need to think geopolitically, but need to think in terms of the, of the models of development that we are developing, I think is most welcome and really interesting. I guess I, I want to build on, on your last few parts of the presentation to ask you a little bit more about how you would think about restructuring food systems, um, whether there's any space for global systems or you think we just need to move to thinking about much more local solutions as you were also mentioning in terms of um, um, agro ecology. And then the, the second is to think a little, although I know it's not your topic about how likely it is? How would you think about political requirements um, at both the macro and the macro level to start thinking about the solutions that were implicit in your presentation? Thank you very much for this uh, two really uh, yeah interesting questions, and which is very which are very important for me and also for all of us to think about. I think. Um, uh, my response to the second question is that I think, like I said in the book and also in my presentation, I think we need to, uh, we need to first, uh, you know, try to get away from this geopolitical blame game in a global scale instead of you know like just try to push the ball to the US or US try to push the ball to, to, to China to blame this, uh, this global public health crisis. I think globally and internationally, we need a much uh, you know, better geopolitical and political uh, awareness that just you know, blame each other. It's gonna even make things worse for global uh, collaborations and coordinations to face this uh, micro level of, of challenges that we are all facing also with the climate change. So I think uh, that's one layer. And then the second layer would be how places like China and also other places like Brazil, India, those rising uh, emerging or large um, size of e e economy, how they together with uh, broader African countries and Southeast Asia, how they gonna shape their own uh, national development, uh, let's say a food system and for production and consumption and distribution in a much uh, resilient and also uh, in a much uh, uh, social and ecological sustainable way. And with its broader, you know, political issues like land rights and uh, land reforms, I think this is has to be has to be uh, falling upon that more like national level. But also, uh, as we can see, what happened in India, we need to to pay more attention to the real on the ground um, land politics and agrarian uh, struggles together with this uh, pandemic and climate struggles as well. And then the, the more local level for me, I can see there are more political and social movement and transformation happen in places like, um, for sure, like uh, Brazil MST and also other places like India, the farmers um, protests just happened in early this year, but also in places like China. I have seen a lot of more quiet political and social moment that people are trying to get away from this really not sustainable and problematic industrialized modernization and food system, food and farming system and lifestyle in general. I have seen a lot of new farmers, which most of them who are very young and got a education from college. So they return back to countryside. I have seen a lot of this type of new trends, um, but clearly need more political uh, space for them as well and support. Um, then the first, to refer to the first question, I think that's also linked to the second question in you know, how we could rethink and restructure our our food system, uh, not just uh, uh, globally, but also starting from local. 
for me, I think uh, the the this interlink between local and uh, global food system, it's very interesting for us to pay attention, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a lot of disruptions. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a national level of uh, uh, research uh, to look at the disruptions to the food supply chain in the US. So we have seen a lot of um, uh, like fragile and vulnerable characters of the, the long food mouse and also the, the highly we call global and large scale uh, and very com complicated and whole complex complexity of food supply chain, especially due to the, the logistic disruptions in one place. You can see the food price rise not just in, in China, but also in US. So I think um, to, to think about restruct food system, for me, I think we need to think um, in, a, in a much, uh, on the ground and local level as well, how we could um, re, re, restructure our regional food supply chain. And also like um, uh, Laura mentioned in the beginning of the, the, the talk today that we need to think more about animal welfare and also how we, uh, how we should uh, try to rethink our doubt, our you know, modern doubt uh, there. Yeah, uh, so I, I think um, it's, it's not just really on the consumer's part, but I also think it's also highly linked to the uh, to the, the the production part and the distribution as as a whole. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have so many questions. The, the, the story is so fascinating because, first of all you show very well in the book that the crisis, that new pandemic was caused by elite consumption. It's, it's the test of the very rich that push, you know, this, um, this new market, this new commodification of wild animals. And, you know, they are almost not, it's not correct to label them wild because they are being farmed. Um, there is a, an expanding market, which means that they are now farmed. Um, and so it's very interesting because I remember 10 or 20 years ago, people were projecting that as China was going to become more, I mean, richer and becoming more than a middle income country, people were going to increase the consumption of beef. And so here, it's, it seems that that has not really happened, you know? So it, on the one hand, you see the impact of culture that people prefer to eat certain foods that they identify as Chinese, even if they have to import them from other countries because they are no longer uh, available in their own country. Um, and it's these influencers on the social media that are promoting this wild food as being more healthy than the food that is not sufficiently regulated by the government. I mean, I can't on, you know, the, the, intricate, the intricacy of the story are just mind blowing, I find, because you can see how the government is so good at controlling and regulating so many things, yet, it seems that the population in China feels that their uh, food chain is not safe, that there is a lot of uh, fraud, a lot of, um, you know, that, that too many pesticides, or you cannot trust the food that is being sold in the supermarkets or anywhere else. And so there is a niche for this kind of expensive, healthier food. You know, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think that's quite unique. I can't think of a situation that is similar to that anywhere else. Because you see, you keep talking about global capitalism, but here we have a very clear case where I understand what you mean about global commercial economic forces, but everything you said is very Chinese. You know, it's, it's, it's about how these markets are developing within China and being driven by elite consumption. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for this uh, really uh, insightful uh, um, comments and also, you know, like try to stimulate my uh, my thoughts on this. I think it's quite interesting uh, to look at um, the, the Chinese characteristic of uh, dietary habit and transformation uh, in this recent uh, few decades. Uh, so that's also uh, my, uh, my, my primary research focus, which is food safety in China. So for me, I think it's quite interesting to look at um, um, the, the state making the government uh, authority together with the, the, the trust from, from not just the, the people in general, from the elites, from the middle class and up middle class level. Like how we could put in all these elements together to look at this as a whole picture. I think food safety is definitely a very a useful lens for me and for us to, 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 to see through this, uh, this whole uh, complexity. And also together with this is the environmental uh, 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 crisis, which mostly links to the toxic, toxicity and also this uh, pollution, not just um, air pollution, but also a lot of soil pollution, water pollution, and a lot of house uh, parts there. People getting really anxious with what they are eating may cause problem for their house, but also they want to know, like you said, what is trustworthy? What, what, what is, uh, who is more trustworthy in terms of their food uh, governance? So I have seen more and more middle class, mostly urban middle class, um, who are more elite compared with the peasant and uh, migrant workers. I think they have trying to find out their way, what I call together with some other colleagues, alternative food networks. They, they, they try to find their own organic food products through their social networks, mostly linked to different CSAs, but also you know the rural communities. They feel they have more like person person to person connections instead of uh, really put all their their trust in the government uh, or third party uh, certificates so i have seen this anxiety uh, in chinese society which also for me it's quite interesting to put this in the uh, uh, covid-19 pandemic uh, as as a whole picture People are getting very anxious with their health and their food and also the in general environment and the government uh, credit. Then what happened is that the more privileged people not just turn to um, like beef or other like green vegetables and, and other type like more healthier and much trustworthy that uh, options, but also they are trying to internalize this um, long traditional cultural practices. Like they became more like therapeutic food um, driven. Like they, they combine um, the food together with the, the medicine because Chinese traditional medicine uh, mostly links highly with the food atoms as well. So as you can see the pangolin story and the bamboo rights, mostly pangolin, which is very useful as a TCM for its scale and mostly for uh, women who, who need breastfeeding. They, they, will, they, will, they will consume some of those products to to, to have their, their milk production or things like that. It's really weird whether it's really work or not, but people just, you know, you know it's kind of like a, the basic sense for people and with more advertisement and yada, yada. So it's just become very, uh, very, very like accepted widely. And also the meat mostly consumed by, that is more like, uh, uh, up class, very uh, closed door, very like it's not for for 
for common people. I have never consumed <laughs> bamboo rice or, or pangolins, but uh, they have their own like social circle. Then they they will they will share this delicacy as as special and, and as very very like very healthy and exotic uh, a food item or gifts in a, in a in a kind of like social gathering. So you can see in the Huanan market they have the mainstream more regulated uh, uh, agri food, but also you have seen this kind of like more gray zone or underground uh, type of wild animal or farmed wild animal products circulating in, in that whole large scale of modern, but still quite not really fitting in the modern standard market places. And it's quite interesting to look at the scale of all of them, like Xinfa Di and the Wuhan Huana market. With the Chinese uh, development and the rising economy, they become larger and larger by size and also putting more and more people and products, lab animals, and everything just together in that, in that specific place. So for me, I think that whole, that's just cultural practices, but also political and economic practices of uh, food uh, consumption is also quite uh, problematic with its transportation and the e-commerce as well. It's very, it's booming. Yes, it's, it's amazing. But Lee, there is another question I wanted to ask you. In your book, you make it very clear that there is something with the hospitals. And I was fascinated by the descriptions you had of hospitalization and of um, a medical health care, because on the one hand, you show how highly effective the system was in China because it's so well organized that very quickly they could actually address, you know, although they made mistakes at the beginning, they really mobilized very quickly and efficiently address the crisis. And yet you keep saying that the crisis is also being reinforced by <clears throat> the centralization of his health healthcare system, but there is not enough um, not enough prevention, not enough small units that are more dispersed throughout the country and these big, big hospitals mm -hmm. that are privatized. And so do you think it's exactly the same problem as the United States or do you think there is something different going on? What is the kind of policy development policy recommendation you have when it comes to the state delivering healthcare systems and, and the lessons of understanding the Chinese issue compared to what is happening in Europe or in North America? Thank you very much, Laura, for this uh, really great question. Because uh, in the second half of the book, I, I, I basically focused on the, the, the containment and the measures um, from the Chinese society and Chinese government, but mostly focused on the, the, the public health uh, and measures. So I think uh, based on my uh, observations and experiences uh, and my research, I think uh, definitely um, there is a really quite interesting dilemma here within the current mainstream hospital or public health system in China, which is which is kind of like, a, 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 I would say a con transformation in the transformation process, which not directly replicate from US, but when we look at CDC, Chinese CDC, and also the privatization of the hospital system and reform in China, you could find actually it's very similar to the modernization of agriculture in China, which is highly, for me, which is highly, we can see a lot of similarities with the US and the rest of the, uh, the, the, the capitalist uh, public health system in the world. Because on one hand, you have the legacy from the socialist moment 
that everyone should have um, have this uh, share of uh, free or affordable uh, health care service, but also on the other hand, with the privatization since um, the open up reform, um, you could see there are some really interesting transformation happening in public health system in China, which uh, speaks to the, 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 the global public health framework, which is highly commodified and privatized, privatized, even though it has the Chinese characteristic to care about the poor or the rural area, but with the hukou system and still the legacy from the hukou system, you still can see there is a, a huge uh, inequality, the clear inequality in rural and urban where between the poor, poor urban and rich urban, there, there's that type of clear um, inequality that's also uh, different but similar to the in the US, you could see in different uh, neighborhoods based on race and, and gender and also class, there's this public house uh, inequality. So for me, China also has uh, much massive and dramatic uh, hospitalization transformation happening in these recent three decades or, or around. Because um, if we pay attention to the, the COVID-19 pandemic epidemic, you could see the first cluster, the early cluster was linked to uh, Huana Market and other neighborhood, but also the hospital infection played a really important role to, to speed up this, uh, this, uh, this epidemic because hospital, uh, hospital, hospitalization in China means highly concentration of sick people and their family members who keep them a company to see the doctor, to be hospitalized. And also with uh, this uh, uh, unprepared um, stock of PPEs, the, 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 the medical care workers were really under that type of difficult situation in that really vulnerable and dangerous moment right in the beginning of the, this whole uh, epidemic. So they become sick. And then hospital played a really major role in the, in the, 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 the as a super spreader event in that moment. That's why in my book, I try to uh, give the credit of this effective uh, hospital treatment and this technology and, and the government support. But also I try to give the warning that concentrate hospital in large cities, which means the hospital system is also very vulnerable. And uh, we need to democratize and also decentralize the hospitals and the healthcare systems, which was which was quite good uh, back to the most moment, even though there are also a lot of problems, but there were even more bad for doctors in rural area. Nowadays, if you go to the rural area, if you go to countryside China, you would really rare to find a good enough doctor because most of those already got concentrated in the urban area and large hospital get more money and get more uh, government refund, uh, government funds and also more patient. It's kind of like a business running bigger and bigger. And then those um, more like rural or smaller ones become really marginalized and then got disappeared or merged by others. So for me, I think that's one thing. And then the other thing is that I think too much attention paid to this successful public health measures in China is quite problematic for the society and for, uh, for people to really rethink what was going on at the first place, in the first place. Like we need to pay attention to the success of the Chinese government contain the epidemic with a lot of cost but we need to pay attention to why this happened. After the SARS, we have the 
a national alarm system to to sound, but then it's failed. So I think um, just pay attention to the public health or biomedical, um, just pay attention to those measures. It's not enough. It even can um, prevent more complex, more complex and more coherent and holistic way to prevent uh, this public health crisis at the first place. Yeah. Thank you. That's so useful to, to hear all of this from you, Lee. But um, do you think that people in China are drawing the lessons of what has happened with COVID in terms of their awareness that climate change is going to create more, you know, more disasters of the kind, if you want to call them disasters, and that hospitals have a special role to play, not just for humanitarian relief, but you know, for all kinds of complex um, health situations. Is there, is there such a discourse? Is there such an awareness? I mean, how do people discuss these issues in China? Are they allowed to talk about it? I mean, are they having a policy debate around, you know, how COVID preparedness, they can draw lessons from for, uh, you know, climate change more generally? I think this is really quite, uh, yeah, this is really quite interesting and important question that you asked, Laura. I think uh, this is also a, a huge question for me, even before I wrote this book, because uh, for me, I think we should not blame ourselves for everything, but I think be aware of what we can do, no matter you are, non-Chinese or you are Chinese, I think this is quite in important for all of us come out through this uh, pandemic. But from what I observed, uh, I observed, I think this topic in this book is quite political and social sensitive, not just to the government, to everyone. Because COVID indeed, I think shape, uh, the mindset for a lot of people in China, not just uh, to rethink what we can do. I think there are quite um, more people. There, there are some really, uh, really, uh, really, uh, I would say, progressive groups in China, uh, not just in theory, not just working on theory and academic academia, but also in real uh, on the ground um, practices like new farmers, like I mentioned or urban consumers. I think from what I can see, they have already paid attention to the broader climate change, environmental uh, issues, and this, uh, this uh, trust issue of food and environment and health, and they are trying to take action. However, what I can see is that with this um, geopolitical tension and this racial, more like racist way, like blame China or Wuhan virus or Chinese virus. I think Chinese, Chinese, I wouldn't speak for all Chinese, but I think it's become very sensitive for everyone to even sitting there to have a much um, rational and uh, much um, open and public a discussion about this the oranges of COVID-19, because we have seen WHO had done um, the first round of investigation in China. So from what I can see, the majority in China would feel, okay, that part is done. It's most likely come to China through the cold supply chain or, or whatever other way. It's most likely not from here. That's the, the, the very common and ordinary way to see this as an externalized you know, issue. So I still think we need a much long way and more work to, you know, not just to, 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 to help people to think about. It. I think they also need, the whole Chinese society also need a moment after this after this international and geopolitical tension and shock and pressure, so they are the one being blamed. 
important. So I, I think, uh, like I said, um, we need more, we need more international and global, you know, much rational and broader conversation and fundamental conversation about the, the cause and also the, the, the way we have to, to prepare for the next disaster and whatever type of disaster is, which place first to start. I think in at this moment, I don't quite feel that, especially people in China, also in the US can see there are various different type of views on this. So I can see we are still in the process of the post pandemic or post disaster or still in the disaster mode. So I think we need a little bit more time to really can have a much rational uh, conversation and scientific conversation on this broader issue, not just look at COVID, but also uh, climate change. Um, I have also just one more quick thing. I have um, done some really uh, interesting field work with uh, uh, some uh, ethnic minorities in Guangxi province, which are mostly women uh, cooperatives. They are trying to deal with climate uh, change, mostly drought and flood and wind. So they have their own projects to uh, cultivate their own local maize, corn, and also have their local uh, livestock varieties. And they also coordinate with scientists from China's uh, Science Academy and also others and some international NGOs and the scholars as well. So I have seen some really prog progressive and hopeful thing on the ground of agricultural uh, and social you know, transformation before the pandemic and during the pandemic still ongoing, but clearly pandemic indeed reshape the whole not just man side, but also the whole, I think the whole emotion as well in China. Um, yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Because, you know, again, it's a bit like with hospital um, privatization. We have that sense of how in a time of crisis, you know, there are this rising nationalism, you blame the other yeah. and you know, the politicization of national identities can be very good at mobilizing resources, but also can have a lot of counter effects. So my last question was very much about what, how do you see the role of these highly qualitative sociology anthropology you practice as a scholar? Um, how can we develop robust methodologies for policy research, you know, on this climate environment development nexus? Um, for example, I don't know if you've seen this colleague from Oslo, Thomas Eriksson has become quite active on this um, arena uh, recently, and there was a special issue of social anthropology in 2020 mm -hmm. on the enforced cooling down of an overheated world. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, they put that you know, they, they put lots of things in that in, in that special issues that seem to indicate that, you know, there are ways for people who do this highly qualitative research to contribute to this policy research arena, um, to, to draw these public histories of the contemporary as another website, you know, calls it. Um, and Arjun Apadurai, who, who is in the United States, but speaks very much from the Indian, you know, um, context in which, with which he is so familiar, where he says that the COVID crisis demonstrates that all national sovereigns are weak and that the only reliable site for a politics of survival is, is, um, is society. Huh? Um, and, and so other people in China talks about that new social space. And so I, I just wonder whether these are things that are difficult to measure, but that um, an anthropological or qualitatively informed sociological lens could, um, could bring more. And I know in your book as well, you talk a lot about the role of rumors as well. So I don't know whether you wanted to comment on, on this methodological issue. Thank you very much for this methodological question, Laura. I think uh, um, for me, 
uh, without a, a very good method, you couldn't you couldn't just just go go forward for any you know research topic and with a much nuanced you know theoretical engagement. So for me, uh, I think uh, like you said, the the really uh, on the ground and high quality um, qualitative social science research uh, give us uh, I think the first hand of the the, the materials and what's really going on. Uh, you know, as as the outsider, but also you can be, you know, you can be an insider when you're really trying to embed yourself in that social and cultural and also that whole political even uh, setting with some specific group of people you're trying to look. I think for me, um, um, the methods part, I I think I'm highly highly, um, uh, you know, value the the ethnographic, ethnographical, you know, research methods. First, um, for me, that's the one of the best way to really trying to dive in myself on the ground. What is really going on after you know massive or reading and no matter journalistic or journal articles and books. Then when you really hit the ground, then you will really notice that. What is the difference? What is what is quite not the same, or what is quite similar, or what is completely different? So when I uh, conducted my doctoral research, even though on this book, um, COVID book, most of my research method is uh, living digital archives. I try to to build up through this pandemic, as many of uh, us being online. So I think that's one of the innovation I tried and forced myself to, you know, to, to, to work on. But before this, I, I, I was, I was doing most of the field work in person. Uh, I went to different communities and talked with different group of people. It's not just talking, like I normally was sitting together with the local communities with different family and household to have a real meal and go to their market, just you know, just just being there and have a have a regular life base there, and have some really important people from there to support me, and also I was able to I was able to get access to the government. Uh, uh, government resources as well. I was able to keep uh, some of the government uh, um, uh, officials in their food safety inspections and also see in their word how things are. And then back to you know the regular peasant life or open consumer's life, then how things are different and how things connected. So I think being back and forth and being, you know, switch uh, uh, among these different actors and different systems, I was able to see the top down and also like more like bottom up. I would, I, I use this uh, as one of my, my, my terms in one of the paper I published based on my doctoral research. I could see these interactions, these two different types or even more different types of um, interactions happening in that specific uh, area, like food inspections. So I think um, being in the field is really, really uh, helpful, but I think we also need rethink the data or the everyday life exposure we got in the field, what that really refers to, what that really means. So that means, really put yourself in the much nuanced theoretical debate and academic debate together with the public debate. I think being back and forth among non-academic and academic theoretical and practical you know, settings, that really enables me to, to think back and forth as a whole process of, you know, of understanding what's really going on with the issue that I'm looking for, like what is really going on with food and farming. I really rarely uh, limit myself to a specific topic. Normally I would also expand my interest 
to, uh, for example, land issues and rural society, uh, social relations and personal life change, and also broader issues like their health care, their education transformation as a whole. So it's kind of like a whole bundle of everything. Then I couldn't, sometimes I got lost, but sometimes I got this more broader picture of what, what is really going on of that group of people person, like the peasant, what's really going on with their life. It's not just their produced food, but also they're the ones suffered the most to deal with the, uh, the, the privatization and commodification of healthcare, marriage, and also the, the, the healthcare. So I think that's, that can help me really understand food is just one of the lens for me to look at their struggle so uh for the solution also even broader anyway go back to the this book um i try to 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 use most of the social media and also document uh government documents that are archived like i said it sometimes it's very easy got lost uh deleted or altered uh, in chinese we call fall for like you couldn't find it even though sometimes there's just dis disinformation. However, what I found really interesting and useful is that in my method, I try to trace what is really going on with that specific rumor, uh, like lab leak. I want to see both Chinese and also English news uh, and social media platform. I dive in both, try to navigate what is really going on, why different group of people think different ways. So I think, um, being in being online also switch with the real life offline life gives me this type of privilege to have both you know both sides the you know both sides materials that's why i think after this pandemic i think we're gonna have more time and you know engagement in online so for me i think digi digital archive for me is a very interesting uh, and challenging but also useful way for the new generation where i'm more good at you know better at you know like us uh, for this digital thing so i think um that can be a really useful method for us to continue not just observe but also practice uh, so i think um being being online also helped me connect to China and Chinese society, even though I'm not physically there. So I think that's quite helpful. And also language capacity and also the understanding of the social life. Like nowadays, the, one of the biggest uh, social media uh, discussion or social or political movement in China online is the, the Chan woman in Jiangsu. So I'm not there, but I have been in different WeChat groups and also uh, Sina Weibo and other platforms to observe also trying to see what's really going on. So I think that's also part of my methods to conduct research in this really challenge, but kind of like a new normal life. Um, yeah, I will stop here. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, you're right, there is a lot more that we're going to be able to, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to reflect more upon on these uh, complex research methods that as qualitative, qualitatively minded researchers, we are being involved. But my last question really, Lee, was how do you think that your experience of writing this book on COVID on this pandemic, on reflecting upon development and climate change, how do you see that changing the way we do development studies? You already told me that it is changing the way you work as a qualitatively minded researcher, uh, but when it comes to paradigms of development, understanding of what modernization, what development is, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, how do you see that these researchers made you think differently um, about development? Uh, I think, yeah, this is a really great question. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. I think uh, um, uh, through, my, through my own 
uh, academic and uh, scholarship, I think this is a quite interesting transition moment for me as a, as a junior scholar. Uh, first, I think um, when I started my PhD in China, I didn't realize I stepped in uh, in development, so development sociology or development studies or rural, rural development, no matter what you call it. So the key research themes and focus or theoretical engagement are there. So then I realized um, actually uh, my research interest in, in food uh, in farming transformation is one of the really uh, uh, important piece in agrarian studies, also development studies, because in China, most of people will refer rural area and also mountainous areas, those frontier areas as backwards place and people there need more development, need, need more civilization. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite interesting, but also, on the other hand, I think with my personal, with my personal uh, experiences and my background, um, I think I have found the connections between the academic world and my, my identity. I'm from rural China, I'm from Henan province. Um, uh, so um, as a woman, I have gone through many challenges when I, since I was young, since I was born, I was second kid. So I was unwanted. So I, I, I couldn't really figure out what was really going on with broader understanding or deeper understanding of the society and China's development. But then when I, when I come through all this um, college and higher education training, I was still not quite clear how I should identify myself and also the place where I'm where I came from, the rural area, Chinese countryside. So in the PhD, I think development studies indeed offer me a very uh, useful and confident space to look back to my identity, to look at the rural issue, to look at the peasant issue. Because before that, I was really shy or feel ashamed to say I'm a peasant daughter or I'm um, I'm from the backward place because that place is less developed. So I was like most of others, I take development, the big development as, uh, as something, yes, that means modernization, that means the even westernization. So for me, I, I think that whole process of the co- uh, co-development of myself and my my academic training also enables me to put myself in this whole like real life experiences to think about what is development because I have many friends who are migrant workers, my family, my parents as well, my sister as well. So I choose a different path, different from them. But when I really uh, step out, from the Chinese society, when I when I when I was still in China, I was still figuring things out of these big issues, agrarian studies and and also feminist uh, agrarian uh, uh, feminist uh, uh, political ecology and all those big terms that in China we really rare to to talk about. But I then I was able to find out actually these are quite useful and interesting for people in that society, in that setting to really think about who we are and also how China should continue its national development, but also the whole you know, modernization by itself, focus on its domestic issue, but also in the global um, development, how China should and could play some positive role. For example, the China and, and Latin American relation, mostly agribusiness and minor, 
So it caused a lot of environmental and ec ecological and social issues there in the other side of the world. I didn't even notice when before I, I, I came out from that whole social setting and society, then I realized how important China's development means to this whole world. And I think uh, I only realized then was like 2015, because I heard many people talk about China and Chinese peaks and Chinese consumptions, yada, yada. Then I realized, oh, the domestic issues um, I was trying to look at in China actually is it's connect highly connect to with connect to these international questions and global questions about China. So I, then at that moment I was able to bouncing you know between global and and local or China's issue or global issue. So with this pandemic, I think it's indeed. Um, it's it's indeed a really useful and helpful stimulation for myself to 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 be able to step in the China's question development or climate change question not just you know focus on pandemic but I think pandemic is just you know a really important pitching point for us but also I was able to to step out to think this like global and international development what we should what we want for the, the the new century it's already two decades past already so I, I think this is the huge question for me to carry with my own research and also my teaching because teaching is also really uh I, I i taught in china but also here in the u.s so i have seen the millennials their view of development modernization China's um, post-socialist or China's China's development and China's rising and China US relation and, and with the other parts of the world. So I think I have seen this really interesting trans, trans, transition moment of for me and the, the younger generation to observe together and study together, but also uh, change together. I think, um, yeah. Yeah, we'll stop Thank here. Thank you so much. Now, this is absolutely fascinating, Lee. You don't know. I mean, it's we feel so privileged to be able to talk directly with someone who has the richness of experience that you have had. Diego, would you like to say a few more words? Because I think it's going to be soon time to, to say goodbye. No, no, just to add to Laura's thing. Um, thank you. This was really interesting and, and as Laura had said across the time, very connected to things we do and, and how we need to start continuing thinking about both research, fieldwork, but also the links between the environment development and um, the way we organize society in a way. So thank you so much, Lee. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for, yeah, for having this moment with me. And uh, yeah, I will be always, uh, around and accessible for for any you know further uh, conversation and many many thanks and uh, look forward to have more conversations and collaborations thank you very much lee i'm sure that in uh, not too long you'll be able to come to oxford um but uh, in the meantime good congratulations again on your appointment at armas college and um have a very good day, very good evening for us. Thank you all. And uh, see you for the next lecture in a couple of weeks time, I think, which will be on the agrarian movements in, uh, in India. Bye-bye, Lee. Bye-bye. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Diego. And thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>